This video is going to provide an overview of the diversity of reptiles. And in the background, we'll be playing uh, some videos I have in separate playlists. And obviously, they go into some of these uh, details in, uh, or some of these topics in greater detail, so feel free to uh, visit them. This first playlist is going to introduce reptiles and then lizards and crocodiles. And if you ask why are those two groups together, it's because the other two playlists uh, on turtles and snakes are gonna highlight um, the lizards and or the, the turtles and snakes which live in the Northeast United States uh, where my students uh, live. And so there's a focus on local biodiversity. Uh, so that's uh, why they're separate. So um, reptiles, in addition to uh, mammals and birds are called amniotes. Now, if you look at these toads, they are reproducing in water and they are dependent on water. Many of them breathe through their skin significantly. I mean, some salamanders even lack lungs and do all of their breathing through their skin. And when it comes to reproduction, many of them reproduce in water, lay their eggs in water, and their larvae develop in uh, water. So a lot of amphibians are dependent on water, which isn't bad, but obviously in many parts of the world, it's arid. Um, in many times of the year, it may not be raining. And so if you're breathing, if your reproduction, if the health of your larvae, your young, are tied to water, um, this limits the success that you can have in terrestrial environments. Now notice here, these are water snakes. Obviously water snakes are comfortable in water, but look at what they're doing. They're having sex on land. They will lay their eggs on land. So these are amniotes. And so they adapted to life on land and therefore um, became more successful than, than the amphibians. <coughs> the amphibians had the world to themselves for a while and were the dominant terrestrial vertebrates, but the reptiles soon surpassed uh, them. Um, from these first amniotes, then come all of the amniotes today. So the uh, ancestral amniotes of the Carboniferous period are the ancestors of all of the reptiles, all of the birds, and all of the mammals alive today. And here you can see there's all of these features that amniotes share. So in those snakes which were repro uh, reproducing, um, reproductive structures like the penis and the clitoris. These are things that only amniotes possess. No amphibian has them. Even if amphibians practice internal fertilization, as some salamanders do, it's not uh, using those uh, reproductive um, uh, structures. Um, and then amniotes share many other features of their respiratory systems, etc. Um, and so amniotes then improved their adaptations uh, to land. Now let me uh, touch on the respiratory and, um, and the extra, em extra embryonic membranes in uh, these next videos, but they're all, they were also mentioned there. So when an embryo first develops, obviously some of its cells are becoming its body, as in this cat embryo. So some of the cells there are the embryo cells making the body, arms, legs, eyes, etc. But here are some of the cells as well. They are not making the body per se, but a membrane around the body, an extra embryonic membrane. Now, going back to fish and amphibians, there was a yolk sac depicted here in yellow because embryonic development takes uh, energy, and so yolk is important. Um, but here, if we notice, there are additional extra embryonic membranes. Uh, there is the amnion in blue, which surrounds the embryo in an amniotic fluid. There is the chorion in red, which either forms the inner eggshell membrane performing gas exchange across the eggshell, or it forms the fetal part of the placenta uh, performing gas exchange with maternal tissues. As a result of this, look at what this turtle is doing. It's a painted turtle, it's aquatic, but it comes on to land to lay its eggs. These extra embryonic membranes, like the amnion, allowed for reproduction on land. That's why lizards, birds, and mammals are called amniotes. They can reproduce on land, unlike the non-amniotes. Uh, um, in addition, there is an allantois, which uh, can collect uh, nitrogenous uh, waste. Now, obviously, in mammals, um, the uh, live-bearing mammals, uh, undergo uh, embryonic and fetal development inside the body of uh, the female. And so, for example, in this human, uh, the red chorion is part of the placenta. 
uh, the amnion is surrounding the fetus and fluid inside the, the female's um, body. But notice that even humans still have the yellow yolk sac and the green allantois. The dog still has the yellow yolk sac, the green allantois, um, etc. So mammals still possess all four of these extra embryonic membranes, even if they aren't technically needed. So the yolk sac isn't the source of the fetal nutrition, it's the mother's tissues. The allantois isn't where the nitrogenous waste goes, the mother's kidneys are. And so two points. One, the extra embryonic membranes allowed amniotes to reproduce on land in a way that amphibians couldn't. Look, this embryo is going to be surrounded in fluid even on land because it's surrounded by an amniotic fluid. It doesn't have to develop in a pond. Um, and then also notice that even um, the amniotes which no longer lay eggs and give live birth. Obviously, most mammals, except for the platypus and echidna, but also many snakes and lizards give live birth. Um, they still have all four of these extra embryonic membranes, even if they aren't needed in the way that they were needed ancestrally. So that was a major development for these amniotes, including, you know, the, which were the first reptiles and modern reptiles. Another uh, significant area with uh, the reptiles, I just go through this very quickly, is they change their respiratory system. Now, obviously, we could go through the, the neck is longer, the trachea is you know, longer, etc. But um, more importantly is now they have these muscles between their ribs. Um, and the ribs are longer uh, than you would find in a typical amphibian. Frog, libs, uh, frog uh, ribs are short. And um, uh, uh, salamander ribs are short. And so if the ribs contact the sternum, it means that you can draw air in um, by moving the ribs. You do not have to uh, then be sucking air in uh, with your mouth the way, say, a salamander does. And so um, uh, rep uh, reptiles and all amniotes are better at breathing. When I just change the volume of my thorax, air comes rushing in and out. I don't have to suck it in and spit it out. Okay. So now that you can breathe better, all right, now that opens all of these possibilities. You become larger. You can become more active. You can have different lifestyles than amphibians, which just have trouble getting enough oxygen to a body to make it that big or to make it capable of active running or you know, flying in the case of birds. And now the reptiles no longer have to breathe through their skin because now their lungs are very efficient at breathing. And if you don't have to breathe through your skin, you can do all of these things with it. You can cover it with these dry scales which now allow you to live in very hot, arid environments because these dry scales offer for protection and protect you from water loss. You know, some descendants of the first amniotes could now cover their skin with hair and feathers, which have uh, advantages. The amphibians, they simply don't have that luxury. They have to keep their skin moist because they have to breathe through it. Some amphibians don't even have lungs like the salamander family Plethodontidae. And so the first amniotes then had all of these advances, and the modern amniotes, reptiles, birds, and mammals, you know, share these uh, to varying degrees. Now, um, obviously, there are so many different kinds of reptiles, especially when we consider all of the fossil ones like the dinosaurs, we want to break them into groups. Um, one of the first ways, and there's a minor, turtles are a problem, they, at least they have been. Um, but in this, when we classify uh, reptiles, one of the things that we could uh, ask is, is there a hole in the temporal region of the skull for jaw muscles? So do the jaw muscles have to stop here, all right, because they go from the lower jaw to here? Or is there a hole and the jaw muscles can go through the hole and thus be longer? And thus a longer jaw muscle then allows for uh, a stronger bite. The first reptiles had no holes, and they were called anapsids. They were literally without holes. That's what the name means. Um, and so anapsid reptiles, the first reptiles, they didn't have as strong as bite. They didn't have a, uh, a hole, an opening in the temporal region of the skull for jaw muscles. Um, and so there were a lot of these, but they mostly become extinct by the end of the Permian period. Uh, we could argue over turtles, for a long time, it seemed anatomically that turtles were um, anapsids. 
Uh, the question was then raised genetically, might the turtles have been diapses, which then had a hole and then lost it? Um, uh, so there was that discussion and there has been with the fossils, this fossil turtle suggests that yes, or this fossil prehistoric suggests that yes, turtles were anapsids, but now this other turtle fossil suggests they were diapsids. So forgive me, I, I don't want to get into that because it, it, there's evidence on both sides and whenever I make a video, it seems like the next paper contradicts it. So, you know, rather than do that. So most of the anapsids went extinct if turtles are anapsids or if turtles are modified diapsids, then all of the an anapsid reptiles then went uh, extinct. Now, some of these early reptiles uh, developed one opening. So here we can see some of those openings here. Uh, so, uh, so here's the, the Permian when the mass extinction occurs. These early turtles, um, some of which only had half a shell, so they had a shell on their underside, but they had thick ribs. Um, these didn't have a hole, they were anapsids, but maybe an earlier turtle did, and so maybe the first turtles lost their hole. Um, uh, so that uh, turtles, you know, are uh, a lineage of early uh, reptiles, and we will uh, be getting uh, to uh, those. Um, uh, some of these amniotes developed one single opening. They were called synapsids, and uh, this will produce lots of uh, lineages of uh, of mammal-like reptiles, and then ultimately the mammals, right? And so if you were to look, you know, in the Paleozoic, we would see uh, a lot of uh, animals uh, which have some mammal and reptile features, um, but then uh, uh, ultimately mammals descend from those. Um, but the reptiles I would like to focus on in this video are what are called the diapsids. Diapsids then have two openings. So anapsids were the first reptiles and maybe turtles. Um, synapsids are the ancestors of mammals and mammals, and then the reptiles which developed two openings for jaw muscles, they are called diapsids. Um, now diapsids would include um, uh, so many groups of reptiles that let's take the diapsids and split them into two groups. So here you see an alligator, and notice there are two holes in the temporal region of the skull, an upper and lower opening uh, for jaw muscles, hence the two uh, in uh, diapsids. From the first diapsids, we get uh, big groups. Um, one of the groups is what is called the uh, lipidosaurs, uh, which I'll be focusing on in a lot of this um, uh, video. Uh, lipidosaurs include lizards, snakes, um, also two other groups alive today, the worm lizards and the tuatara, and then a number of fossil groups as well. Uh, so one group of these is called uh, lipidosaurs. You know, they were certainly fascinating in history. I mean, the giant Komodo dragon had much larger relatives. There were marine lizards, which could be 50 feet long, um, et cetera. Uh, we'll see snakes evolve uh, from lizards. Uh, and then there are these worm lizards, which are uh, also legless. So um, we have lizards, we have snakes, and then we have uh, worm lizards uh, as well, all right? Um, and somewhere, uh, and then also there was um, an extinct group or largely extinct group uh, called the rhinocephalians. Um, so they were quite diverse for a long time. Um, but one species called the tuatara uh, did survive till today, living in uh, New Zealand. And so the lipidosaur group of the diapsid reptiles have produced lots of fossil lineages, but include the tuatara today, um, the lizards, snakes, and worm lizards. There was another group, much you know, more exciting you know, for many people's minds, um, called the archosaurs. Now, arch means to rule. So your arch enemy, that's your you know, major enemy, the archbishop is you know, more influential than the regular old bishop. So archosaurs are the ruling reptiles. Uh, so these would include the dinosaurs, the flying pterosaurs, but would also include um, a lot of other extinct groups and um, two lineages which have survived till today, the crocodiles. So crocodiles are archosaur diapsids and birds, which descended from theropod dinosaurs, which are archosaur diapsids. So as we look at the diapsid reptiles, they gave us lots of fossil groups, including uh, the uh, crocodiles, which have survived until today, and the birds which have to, uh, survived until today. 
Uh, crocodiles are an ancient group going back to the Triassic period, around the time when the first dinosaurs appeared, but they have changed greatly over time. So when crocodiles first appeared, they were certainly not the crocodiles which we have uh, today. Uh, many were small, they were only a foot or so uh, in uh, length. Some were bipedal, all right? And so, you know, we have this early group of crocodiles. Um, they were then replaced after the Triassic extinction um, by a, a number of, of uh, crocodile groups, which we call um, the uh, Mesosuchians. Um, they were quite successful. I mean, some were 40 feet long and longer, you know, would have been capable of eating dinosaurs. Um, so, and many lived in the ocean and were marine uh, crocodiles. Uh, so, you know, crocodiles were um, certainly diverse in this group, but all of this group dies out by the end of the age of dinosaurs in the Mesozoic. Um, but from this lineage then comes uh, another group of uh, uh, crocodiles, which we call the suborder Eusuchia, uh, which includes uh, uh, many fossil forms and the crocodilians alive today. Now this was a giant crocodile uh, from the Amazon, uh, which could be uh, 40 feet long uh, and you know maybe uh, six to eight feet tall at uh, the shoulder. So, uh, there were enormous crocodiles, there were the duck-billed uh, crocodilians, um, uh, et cetera. Um, and so crocodiles have a very long history. Uh, the crocodiles of uh, today uh, did not you know, appear you know, from the beginning, but rather uh, developed over stages. And if you were to consider the crocodiles of uh, today, we separate them into families. So once again, if, if you notice, I've been, you know, here's a big group of amniotes that we then you know split into groups like diapsids and then the diapsids can form group like the archosaurs and then the archosaurs you know can form groups like crocodiles but then the crocodiles there were different groups of those there's a suborder of yusukians which survives till today but then we could break those into a variety of uh families um and so uh one uh family includes uh the garial uh alive uh today they have very narrow snouts um to help them close their mouths uh, quickly and prey on uh, on fish, all right? And uh, they are uh, in danger of, uh, uh, of extinction. There is another family, uh, the Crocodylidae, um, which includes uh, a number of uh, species throughout the world, including many which are endangered. This would include the American crocodile, uh, which uh, in the Southern United States uh, is uh, is endangered and tends to live in uh, coastal uh, areas. Uh, they tend to have narrower snouts than the American alligator. Um, the, the teeth are a little bit uh, different. Uh, many are in critical danger of extinction, the Cuban crocodile being only found uh, in small regions of Cuba, uh, for example. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, crocodiles and then um, uh, there is another family uh, which includes both uh, the alligator in the southeast United States and then also the caimans of, uh, of Latin America. Uh, and so uh, the reptilian diversity of today includes uh, the crocodiles. And this was you know, just a quick mention of some of their diversity. Lizards are an incredibly diverse uh, group. They actually seem to be the oldest of the modern reptilian uh, groups. We could argue whether some Paleozoic forms were, you know, should be considered lizards or the ancestors of lizards. But in any case, uh, they are ancient, far older uh, than, uh, you know, snakes uh, certainly, but then also turtles and uh, crocodiles as well. Um, they include, you know, this great diversity, once again, you know, 40, 50 foot long forms which lived in uh, the ocean. And even modern lizards are quite uh, diverse. So uh, their diversity is beyond me in this quick overview. Uh, and so therefore it's hard to talk about them. For example, talking about their reproduction. Well, you, you would wanna talk about you know, the laying of eggs, but lots of lizards give live birth. Live birth not only is known in lizards, but it apparently evolved multiple times. So in this group of lizards, some lay eggs and some give live birth. And then this other group of lizards, you know, some lay eggs and some uh, give uh, live uh, birth. Um, lizards and snakes are today in, uh, put in the order Squamata. 
Um, and if you ask why are lizards and snakes uh, combined uh, together? Well, the answer is clearly because they share features. Uh, not only do they share genetic uh, features, here are some lizard eggs, um, uh, but then also uh, they share anatomical uh, features. Now, uh, there's a number of them, um, but you know, here's perhaps the most uh, obvious. So uh, in male lizards and snakes, instead of one single penis, there's a pair of hemipenes, um, although males will only use one at a time. You know, and just here's you know, a comment, if we're going to put things together in a group, say if lizards and snakes belong in the same order, then they must share anatomical and genetic features. And so here's an example of you know, this you know, odd feature, uh, which is shared among uh, this, um, uh, this group. Uh, lizards certainly you know, vary in size, uh, in whether they're herbivores or uh, are carnivores. Um, some are capable of gliding. Uh, the marine iguana you know, is capable of you know, uh, spending much of its time feeding in the ocean on algae. Uh, so lizards are uh, quite diverse. And if we include the fossil lizards, um, then uh, that would uh, be even uh, more the case. Now, lizards aren't even a biological group. When we use the term, you know, biological group, we like to say, all right, well, let's, I don't know, pick primates or mammals. Once upon a time, there were the first mammals, and all modern mammals are descended from the first mammals and are more closely related to each other than they are to anything that isn't a mammal. All of the first primates evolved from the first primates, and all primates are more closely related to each other than they are to anything that isn't a primate. Those are nice biological groups. Here, um, lizards aren't a biological group in that sense, because um, we have given different names to lizard descendants which have lost their legs. <coughs> some we call worm lizards, and here are some worm lizards, and some we call snakes. <coughs> Um, but they are descended from lizards. So some of the descendants of the first lizards are called lizards. However, other descendants of the first lizards are not called um, lizards. And so here's the problem. So here we have this great divorce, uh, diversity. These snakes are descended from ancestral lizards, and they are more closely related to these lizards in the yellow box these lizards are more closely related to these snakes than they are to these lizards in the pink box. And so in the family tree, there have been all these branches. Just because uh, these lizards have kept their ancestral legs doesn't mean that they're more closely related to these lizards over here than they are to their cousins who lost their legs. These are worm lizards. They lost their legs, um, but they are more closely related to uh, these uh, uh, lizards than they are to these or these. So. This uh, type of grouping is what we call a paraphyletic uh, grouping. So lizards are very diverse, and therefore that's why I'm going to move on. Um, just after introducing this, they're too diverse uh, you know, to cover to any extensive uh, degree uh, here. Um, and since I'm asking my students to focus on local wildlife, um, the lizards uh, which do occur in the Northeast United States are very uncommon. I've never actually seen one, uh, despite going out looking for them. Um, and so uh, I'll focus on other, um, on other groups of reptiles, um, but many of the things that you know, I say of other groups of reptiles are true here about you know, the, the scales on the skin or the shedding of uh, skin. So here's a, a quick video uh, where uh, a lizard is not only shedding its skin, but will then also eat uh, its scales and recycle some of the nutrients uh, um, afterwards. And so reptiles uh, are ancient, they are quite diverse, uh, and in going through the modern groups of uh, reptiles, uh, I would, you know, I you know, wanted to mention the, um, the crocodilians, uh, the lizards, um, and now I would like to focus perhaps in a little greater depth on the uh, two groups which, you know, can be found in the wild uh, uh, where me and my students live. Uh, in the Northeast United States, the turtles and the snakes. So there haven't always been turtles. Um, and uh, while reptiles first evolved in the Paleozoic era, uh, turtles weren't known until after the Paleozoic ended in that uh, mass 
uh, extinction at the end of the Paleozoic. Uh, the first turtles were not like the turtles which we see here today. Some still had teeth, some only had half a shell. And so turtles evolved um, over uh, time. Now, one of the things that you know, defines the turtles is obviously the shell. The shell has uh, three components. One, thick ribs. So thick ribs are part of a turtle shell. Also, there are dermal bones. So dermal bones are bones which form in the skin, as opposed to, say, starting with a piece of cartilage that then turns into bone. All right, so dermal bones form in uh, the skin. Now, I form some. So like my skull is made of dermal bone. When I was a fetus, I just had my skin. And I said, oh, here's a nice place to make a bone. Why don't I, um, uh, sorry that this is stolen. Uh, so why don't I just make a, a dermal bone uh, here? So this is dermal bone. Um, but uh, many animals can make dermal bone elsewhere. Some mammals do like armadillos can make dermal bone. Um, their cousins, the sloths had dermal bone. Crocodiles have very thick skin, which include dermal bone. Many armored dinosaurs had dermal bone. Um, but then these shells uh, include the um, uh, both ribs, uh, thick ribs and dermal bone. So here you can see in a turtle shell, there are thick ribs which have fused to dermal bone and then have thickened uh, scales uh, uh, superficially, which cover those as well. A number of other, other things, uh, turtles actually in a couple of steps, and we can see this both in fossils and in turtle embryos, um, modified the ribs. So like my shoulder girdle is outside my rib cage, but turtles is actually inside the rib cage. And so they had short ribs, um, which then allowed the uh, girdle to move inside and then the shell uh, then covered it. So that's another neat thing about um, uh, turtles. So turtles are uh, amniotes, obviously reproducing on land, but that female snapping turtle is uh, laying eggs uh, uh, on land. Um, and then turtles evolved in stages. As I mentioned, you know, the earliest turtles were kind of transitional forms. And from these first turtles, there is one suborder known as the pleurodires, which are incapable of retracting their necks inside the shell. These include a number of uh, turtles which are referred to as the long-necked turtles um, uh, that you can find in uh, parts of the world, such as more southern continents um, uh, today. Uh, so I just include them. So that's an earlier branch of the, uh, the family uh, tree. Uh, and uh, they, uh, so here's, you know, I, I explain about uh, the shoulder girdle migrating um, uh, into uh, uh, inside the shell. Um, so it was uh, in uh, the age of dinosaurs that two lineages of turtles uh, evolved, and then one group is predominant, um, predominantly occurred on the southern continents, although even North America had pleurodires. So here's a giant uh, pleurodire uh, turtle, uh, which once lived in the uh, seaway, which covered must have much of the western uh, United uh, uh, States when sea levels were higher. So here you can see one of those long-necked pleurodire uh, turtles. Uh, and so I give some information about those, uh, not only the group, but also there are uh, some uh, turtles in this group which are in critical danger of, um, uh, of extinction. Um, but all of the turtles which uh, live in the Northeast United States are cryptodire turtles, a different suborder which can retract their necks inside uh, their skulls. And then these cryptodires in the, this suborder then can be broken into different families. So once again, um, life has this great family tree and then there are branches and then the branches can subbranch, et cetera. And so within the turtles are these two suborders. Within a suborder like the cryptodires and we have different families. Uh, one a family that lives in our area uh, includes the snapping turtles. Uh, so there are, um, uh, there is uh, the common al uh, snapping turtle in the Northeast United States, but also the Mississippi has the largest freshwater turtle, uh, the alligator snapping turtle, which uh, we see uh, here. And so uh, uh, snapping turtles are in one family, and so thus not as closely related to the turtles which live in other, um, 
uh, in other families. Uh, I give some information about snapping turtles in our area um, because of their large uh, size. You know, they have unique roles in food chains in that, you know, for example, uh, a snapping turtle can prey on things that most turtles can't. So like young ducks, for example, need to be aware of, um, uh, of uh, snapping uh, uh, turtles. So I give some information about uh, uh, them. Here you see a female snapping turtle uh, who has migrated uh, laying eggs on land. Um, snapping turtles, when they uh, mate, uh, the process takes a, a fair amount of time. You know, there's scratching and clawing uh, and, uh, you know, each, you know, spends part of the time uh, underwater. And so, uh, you know, I described this a little bit with, uh, you know, snapping turtles uh, mating uh, here as they do in uh, late spring, early um, uh, uh, summer uh, uh, here. And then once again, talk about uh, their diet. So they are, you know, apex predators as adults, you know, capable of feeding on not only fish, including large fish, um, but also frogs, salamanders, uh, aquatic uh, uh, birds, uh, uh, etc. And so snapping turtles are uh, major predators in our area. Um, and then in the cryptodires, there are other families as well. And so uh, I, you know, just give uh, some examples of the uh, turtles, uh, the freshwater turtles, which exist in the uh, Northeast uh, United States. Uh, note that in addition to having families, you know, we can also have super families and subfamilies. And so as we classify, you know, things based on uh, their similarities and their uh, relationships, obviously, um, you know, there are varying degrees of, um, of relationship here. Uh, some members, once again, are in danger of extinction throughout the world and then even in the uh, United States. Some have adapted to land, uh, and we sometimes use the word tortoise when we talk about uh, uh, turtles which uh, adapt uh, uh, to land, and that has occurred uh, separately, and then I, uh, in, in different lineages, and then I give some uh, information uh, about the turtles which are most common in our area. So for example, uh, the painted turtle is the most common turtle in the Northeast uh, United uh, States. Uh, so I give information about, uh, you know, these uh, turtles, which are more omnivorous. Um, so they're capable of feeding both on uh, plants and animals. Um, but, you know, this can actually change over their, the course of their life, the degree to which they're including um, uh, plants and animals. Uh, painted turtles are very colorful and there are variants. So, for example, here's a painted turtle variant, uh, you know, found in nature, uh, which is just more red than uh, most painted turtles uh, would tend to be. There are uh, other turtles, such as the spotted turtle, uh, which is not in critical uh, danger of extinction, but nevertheless, the populations have dwindled uh, to the uh, point where this is considered threatened and is protected uh, uh, by law, All right? So here's another turtle that one can find in the Northeast, um, uh, United States. Uh, once again, the adaptation to land has occurred in multiple lineages. And so here in this box turtle, uh, box turtles um, are going to uh, feed primarily on things like mushrooms and vegetative uh, uh, material. And they uh, are primarily uh, found uh, on land uh, and can be quite uh, long-lived. Uh, and so I go you know, through some information on uh, on uh, box turtles, um, wood turtles. Um, uh, also, uh, they can be found in water, um, but then also uh, they can also be found on uh, land and their populations have dwindled to uh, the point where once again, they are uh, protected and um, uh, they are uh, uh, protected uh, by, uh, by law. Um, bog turtles are in critical danger of, uh, of extinction. So these are quite small uh, turtles and uh, the loss of habitat and also the changing of habitat as invasive species such as uh, the uh, plant uh, purple loosestrife 
is changing their habitat. So here in the United States, you know, we have a uh, turtle, which, you know, we are quite concerned with its uh, populations uh, falling, uh, the bog uh, turtle. Okay. Um, and so there are a number of kinds of turtles, including uh, in uh, an upcoming video, I will mention uh, musk uh, turtles, which are another uh, family of, um, uh, of turtles. And uh, so, you know, just the purpose of this was to go into uh, the place of turtles in the tree of life, the diversity of turtles, and then give some information about uh, local uh, turtles because you know turtles are interesting in and of themselves. They are parts of uh, food chains, and so thus very important um, uh, not only in what they eat but the things which prey on those, especially eggs and uh, young turtles. Uh, there are many things which try to dig up turtle nests, whether it be raccoons, chipmunks, skunks, etc. Many things can feed on uh, small um, uh, turtles, like this uh, small musk uh, uh, a turtle uh, here. Um, uh, and, and so uh, treating some of uh, those issues, but then also mentioning that in addition to you know, turtles being endangered throughout the world, uh, many are endangered in the United States to varying degrees. Some more critically than others, some are threatened. And if one includes the sea turtles, which then can be found off the coast of the, uh, uh, you know, of the United States, uh, well, then these are endangered. You know, both through you know purposeful fishing, accidental uh, being caught in um, uh, in uh, nets, uh, and then other things. For example, the plastic bags, which you know we discard and end up in uh, the oceans, uh, look like jellyfish, which some of uh, them feed on. Uh, the hawksbill turtle here, uh, its small shell uh, is you know sold uh, illegally, often in an ornamental. Uh, uh, for, or, uh, for ornaments, and so it uh, has that uh, threat to its populations as, uh, as well. And so uh, this was a brief introduction into the uh, diversity of turtles, and then I would like to end then with the diversity of snakes. Obviously, snakes belong with the lizards, uh, but just given the way that uh, I teach emphasizing the um, the local uh, rep uh, uh, the local reptiles uh, turtles and snakes are the dominant um, reptiles in this part of the world. So snakes, as I mentioned, are descended from lizards. Lizards have lost their legs multiple times. There are legless lizards alive uh, today. There are lizards which are in the process of losing their legs, maybe not having four legs. Um, but still having st stumps where their hind legs were. Um, but then since the evolution of the first snakes, then snakes share many features such as a lightening of the skull, um, the separation of the mandibles, which allows them to now, uh, you know, engulf larger prey, uh, et cetera. And so snakes form a group descended from the first uh, snakes, which evolved late in the uh, Mesozoic era. They have elongated bodies, which have repeated, you know, the various uh, segments. Uh, the um, um, shortest snakes, uh, as far as numbers of segments, may have, say, 100 ribs uh, and vertebrae, uh, whereas, uh, you know, some are more than 300 and some fossil uh, members, it could be uh, 500. And so this uh, certainly uh, has allowed uh, for a great number of types of uh, motion, so they can move side to side, they can climb vertically, and then use scales on their undersides to help uh, kind of uh, move along with muscles attaching to those um, scales. Um, this uh, garter snake here had just eaten a small frog, and so, you know, you one can observe the, you know, the, the frog passing along its digestive tract, but it was, you know, the ability to expand uh, its uh, mouth that allowed it to uh, engulf such um, a relatively large uh, prey item, uh, etc. This snake is sticking its tongue out um, because it's grabbing odorants from the air and then rubbing it up against an olfactory organ, the vomeronasal um, organ. And so, you know, certainly a great deal that we could you know, say about just snakes uh, in uh, general. Obviously, they have these hard scales which help them 
uh, resist uh, water loss. Um, but then to grow, they need to then periodically uh, sh uh, shed their skin, uh, which they tend to do entire as opposed to the reptiles, which are, uh, as opposed to lizards, uh, which um, uh, tend to shed their, uh, uh, their scales in uh, fragments, or the turtles, which tend to then uh, shed their, their scutes uh, one at a time. Uh, so here you can see a shed uh, snake skin, uh, which is made of you know the same dry keratin, uh, which makes up um, uh, hair, nails, feathers. Uh, there are many color patterns which are possible here. Uh, every time a rattlesnake sheds its skin, it adds a little button on the tip of its tail, so the long a rattlesnake that it is, you know, you know although if it's a uh, you know, it would have a short rattle, but still look, uh, but still be old eyes. Uh, so the pigments. Uh, do not serve for, say, camouflage, but instead uh, serve as a warning. So here uh, there are coral snakes, uh, which uh, are venomous, and they advertise this to warn off potential predators with red and yellow coloring. Uh, now, uh, if you are familiar with um, uh, coral snakes, you might say, oh, red and yellow kill a fellow, that there's a way to, to distinguish between the poisonous um, uh, coral snakes and the non-poisonous ones. Um, and while that little rhyme may work in the United States, it doesn't work in other places like Latin America. And the image that I just uh, showed you, um, the, uh, the rhyme doesn't apply. And so you would think that it, something was non-venomous when actually it was. Um, obviously scales uh, can then you know, form these little eyelash structures or look a little hairy uh, as well. Um, the scales on the underside, as I said, are larger and can be used to, to move vertically up a, uh, uh, a surface. Um, snakes are important in food chains. Certainly they're preying on smaller uh, atom, uh, items such as uh, amphibians, frogs, salamanders. Um, many snakes are very good at going after mammals. And so not having legs um, uh, is an adaptation if you're going to try to swim in a burrow or I'm sorry, move through a, a burrow and chase a rodent. Um, the ability to climb vertically then gets you into the trees where then you can feed on uh, eggs. And so uh, many snakes are generalists that can eat a whole lot of things, um, but some snakes are specialists where they, um, uh, they eat a great deal of toads, for example, in hognose snakes, or they're capable of uh, going into trees like black rat snakes and feeding on um, and uh, feeding on eggs uh, there. Obviously, the, the vipers, as I'll see, as I'll go through, are very good at uh, hunting warm-blooded uh, prey. Uh, water snakes can obviously, uh, you know, prey on fish in the water. But then not only can snakes feed on a variety of uh, items, then they're important in food chains because, you know, many uh, birds, hawks, falcons, etc., you know, prey on snakes. Uh, aquatic things like snapping turtles, herons, and bass can feed on, uh, on water snakes. Uh, raccoons, uh, foxes can feed on terrestrial snakes. So snakes are very important in, um, uh, in food chains. Um, I, I had mentioned their reproduction uh, earlier. I just something to point out that some snakes, such as boas, pythons, and some of the, the more primitive lineages of snakes not only have a uh, hemipenis, which you can see uh, here, uh, but also then retain these tiny little spurs, which are the remnants of their hind limbs. So the first fossil snakes had, um, uh, had uh, legs, and we can still see remnants of legs in, uh, in some living snakes. Um, uh, most snakes reproduce by uh, laying eggs, but a large number of snakes actually give live birth. And so in the Northeast United States, there are, there are many uh, snakes uh, which uh, reproduce uh, by uh, giving live birth. And I kind of go through, uh, you know, some of the species in our area, uh, which, um, uh, which do each in, uh, this, uh, in this video. So live birth is not unique uh, to, um, uh, to mammals. And I go through a couple of examples here. 
Uh, now, uh, snakes are certainly diverse. And once again, we break you know, snakes into groups and uh, subgroups. Uh, Many of the families do not occur here. So some of the most primitive snakes, actually you know, they're, they're blind snakes or they're these tiny little um, uh, thread uh, snakes. Um, which don't occur in our area. Uh, but if you were putting the snakes into a family tree, it would be some of the more primitive uh, lineages. And so, you know, I, I give some examples of, you know, these just to kind of understand the diversity of snakes uh, which exist in the world. Uh, and then many of these are in danger of, uh, uh, of extinction. So I give some other examples here. Once again, uh, when we look at living things, uh, it represents the living remnants of a great family tree. And so the branches come off at different points. And so snakes are related to each other, but to varying degrees. And so not only do we have the order squamata, which includes lizards, the suborder serpentes, uh, which is for snakes, we have infra orders uh, where uh, then we have families. And so, uh, you know, snakes are related to each other uh, to varying degrees. Right, and I give some uh, examples of uh, them. Not all of the branches uh, occurring in you know any one specific you know region, like the um, uh, the Northeast United uh, States. And so, for example, you know here we have boas and pythons, interestingly occurring primarily in southern continents. The southern continents had been joined to make a supercontinent uh, for quite uh, some time. Um, uh, known as Gondwana. And one can still see that in the distribution of many animals today, primarily being found in, um, uh, in southern uh, continents from you know, that ancestral uh, distribution. Uh, although many species have a much smaller range, and this can then contribute to uh, their being in danger of extinction. Uh, the boas and pythons include the largest uh, snakes um, uh, today, the boas and the anacondas, and the uh, Amazon had uh, a, a snake, Titanoboa, uh, which could reach 50 feet in length uh, in uh, the fossil record. Um, of the snake, uh, you know, of the snake families, uh, the, I'd like to end with three. There's one known as Elapidae, which includes uh, the venomous uh, coral snakes. Now, while they are venomous, um, their fangs, instead of being in the front of their mouths, are more in the middle of their, um, uh, their uh, mouths. And so uh, it is much harder for them to pose a threat to uh, humans. So while um, they are uh, venomous, the position of their fangs you know, makes them less dangerous uh, to us. Um, the coral snakes, um, but then other you know members include uh, the coral, uh, the cobras, uh, which um, are uh, quite uh, venomous and do cause tragically a number of deaths uh, per year. But in uh, North America and Latin America, the coral snakes are venomous snakes in you know the family uh, Elapidae. Um, by far the uh, greatest diversity of snakes occurs in the family Colubridae. So these are sometimes called the harmless snakes. But it should be pointed out that there are actually a couple which can pose threats to humans in that snake venom is modified digestive enzymes. And so many snakes have digestive enzymes, which if they inflicted into a bite, would then be dangerous. And, and so that's important because, for example, there are colubrid snakes like boom slangs. Um, they're not technically venomous uh, snakes, you know, injecting, you know, a powerful venom through a, um, through a fang. But nevertheless, you know, the glands which secrete, you know, these digestive enzymes, um, they could actually inflict a bite, which actually, you know, could in rare cases be uh, venomous. But although no venomous colubrid lives in the northeastern United States. So most of the snakes in our area are colubrid snakes, and one can then identify them with more of a rounded head compared to the, um, uh, the vipers, which have more of a triangular uh, head. So things like water snakes, garter snakes, um, uh, milk snakes uh, in our area. Uh, these are uh, colubrid snakes, the most common 
uh, snakes uh, throughout uh, the world. Um, many individuals in our, my area will say, oh, look, there's a poisonous water moccasin, uh, when it's not, because they don't live in our area. Uh, and if you looked at their head being, you know, this, you know, nice round head uh, instead of a big triangular head, that would have shown you that what you're, what you confuse to be a water moccasin is actually a harmless water snake, uh, a colubrid uh, snake uh, in, instead. So these are quite uh, diverse. And here I have some pictures of uh, the colubrid snakes in uh, the country of Paraguay, uh, where I uh, lived while I was in uh, the Peace Corps. So we could split you know, this family into a number of subfamilies, um, and some of which have, you know, uh, include uh, members which are uh, endangered. And then I also, you know, just give videos about uh, the colubrid snakes in our area for, you know, students to understand, you know, the diversity in their area. And this would include, say, the black rat snakes, uh, which can climb trees. So I have a video of black rat snakes climbing uh, trees um, where they can, you know, prey on birds and uh, the nests of, uh, of birds. This would include, um, you know, milk snakes, which are more brightly colored, uh, the water snakes, which uh, obviously then um, have a greater role in aquatic habitats, you know, both feeding on, say, you know, frogs and fish, but now also then being, you know, potential prey items for large uh, uh, fish, uh, snapping turtles, uh, great blue herons, and, um, and the like. So I have a number of videos in uh, the playlist which go through the local um, colubrid uh, uh, snakes. So here's one on water snakes as well. And then finally, um, uh, the snake Viperidae includes uh, the vipers in our uh, area. Now, uh, vipers have a more triangular uh, head and they have front-facing uh, fangs, which means that they are, uh, can inject uh, poison. Now, uh, the poison is a modified digestive enzyme. So the main function of poison is to help them kill and then uh, kill their prey, and then actually then even begin to digest their prey um, outside uh, their uh, body. So they could bite something, and as it dies, they can you know, chase a rodent through a, um, uh, you know, and, and catch up with it. One of the things that these vipers have, they're often referred to as the pit vipers, um, because they have um, these pits, which allow them to sense heat, all right? And so, uh, mammals, once they became uh, successful, you know, then diversified with lots of, you know, rodent animals, you know, which were very common and could burrow. And then with that, then came the evolution of snakes, which were very good at hunting uh, rodents. And so a pit viper can now sense an area and sense where there is heat. So many rodents are nocturnal coming out at night, but now these uh, vipers are able to sense, you know, their heat and hunt them um, with this uh, additional, uh, you know, sense that uh, they have using the heat sensitive uh, pits to help track their warm blooded prey. Um, there are many vipers throughout the world. Uh, some are in danger of uh, extinction. Uh, water moccasins uh, do live in the eastern United States, but south of uh, of us. So, you know, if you're north of, say, Virginia and Maryland, uh, then a uh, water moccasin is not something that you're going to come in contact with. So any snake in the water is, is actually just a water snake, and it doesn't have this big triangular head. Um, in our area, we do have both copperheads. Notice the big triangular uh, head and that uh, pit um, uh, there. So here you can recognize that it's a viper for those two reasons. Uh, so copperheads, uh, uh, can inject uh, poison, as can rattlesnakes. And there are a variety of types of uh, rattlesnake, like timber rattlesnakes um, and diamondbacks, etc. Now, while obviously an individual, you know, might be, have some fear of rattlesnakes, etc., you do have to be careful. You know, say a hundred years ago, you know, someone saw a rattlesnake, oh, I said, I'll, I'll kill it. You know, and that'll, you know, protect me, my family from rattlesnakes, you know, certainly understandable. However, because of the dwindling populations, they are actually in danger of extinction and protected by law, all right? And, and so, you know, this, you know if, if one found a rattlesnake, one should, you know, either just 
admire it. Um, or if you feel it's a threat, maybe call you know, a park ranger. Um, once again, they are endangered. And so if you were in the woods and you saw a rattlesnake and, and killed it, um, well, that could actually then, you know, uh, you know that, that's, that's a crime. And uh, this you know, potentially opens you up uh, for those legal issues. Uh, so here you can see a timber rattlesnake. And notice it has that uh, larger diamond-shaped uh, head. And uh, it is w waving its rattle as a warning. It would like to be left alone. Um, but you know, because it can inject a venom, you know, the, if someone's going to attempt to bother it, you know, it's going to inject it with the venom, and then hopefully the predators in the area then learn to avoid uh, these um, uh, these venomous uh, snakes. All right, uh, and so uh, this was then just a uh, an overview of reptiles and their diversity. Uh, you know, introducing the crocodiles and lizards, just mentioning their diversity, in addition to, you know, how we group reptile groups. Um, but then also, uh, for those living in the Northeast United States, you know, there are also uh, videos in my playlist which give a little bit of information into the local, um, into the local turtles and uh, snakes, which uh, then can be found and appreciated in nature.